All right, welcome back everyone. I see that we have reached the quorum to restart our session. Just one short announcement or reminder, um, an early reminder uh, for the tutorial sessions that will start in the next days and also run into next week. There is There are instructions linked from the from the Indico page, at least from the description, I will add it as explicit material also to the tutorial sessions. But there are instructions which um, show you what you can already prepare in terms of prerequisites, in particular installing Docker on your system such that you can easily use the, the Docker images that um, are going to be distributed to run all the tutorial sessions in. So uh, feel free to already have a look uh, today uh, such that tomorrow when the first tutorial starts in the afternoon that you're set up from the technical side and can get going right away with the physics. All right, in that sense, I think um, we're ready to hear more about Monte Carlo event generators from Stefan. It's more okay, yours. Um, let me steal the screen share and restart. Welcome back, everyone, after the break. Hope you had a chance to stretch your legs and get a coffee or something. Um, we left off uh, in the last lecture um, where after describing a bit how uh, parton showers work, how the parton shower itself is used in order to address uh, final states with more and more radiation. The final state of a simple, let's say, two to n scattering with more radiation such that you produce n, bigger n particles in the final state. And then how to combine this calculation with um, precise calculations of the hard cross-section, the, the sort of prior distributions, in order to get uh, a, a better model to describe well-separated and high-energy par partons and jets in the final state. But unfortunately, or, or maybe fortunately, um, when we collide um, composite objects, at, for example, at uh, the LHC, but also at RIC, and Tevatron, these things, um, the initial state is, is much more complex than just considering uh, consisting of two fundamental particles. They're bound systems that you collide. So in a sense, there's no reason to expect that only a single interaction between these, uh, between these composite objects will occur. If more than one interaction occurs, then you uh, have to start wondering does the inclusion of additional secondary interactions actually influence the rate of a first interaction to occur? And um, a priori, there is no good reason why this shouldn't be the case, that maybe if you have uh, three interactions that occur, that the hardest, in, the hardest of those interactions is, uh, has a different rate than um, if, no addition, if only one interaction occurs. A priori, no good reason really for this, to, uh, for, uh, um, uh, for, for this to happen, except as always, unitarity. But let's look at, um, a, uh, at what scattering cross-sections actually look like. Or what, so the naive inclusive cross-section for a parton parton scattering quite often is actually already singular, divergent, already at leading order, not even beyond leading order, but already at leading order. For example, the scattering of two gluons into two gluons is singular when the transverse momentum of the final state gluons goes to zero. That means that the cross-section, because uh, it's uh, a cross-section depends on a type of regularization cut, a minimum PT that you have to require. And depending on what that minimum PT is, the cross section can actually, um, the cross section for this gluon, two gluon going to two gluon scattering can actually be larger than the total interaction cross section between the protons themselves. For example, here there's a, an example where if you look at proton proton collisions at the LHC, the total cross section is roughly 100, um, uh, 100 millibounds. But um, the in integrated cross section for glue glue goes to glue glue is much larger than that if your regularization cut PT min 
is small because it shields a singularity. Similarly, even at a fixed, uh, at a fixed um, um, uh, regularization cut, the cross section for platonic to to do scatterings will actually exceed the total cross uh, possible scattering cross section um, once you increase the um, center of mass energy, because then you have more phase space to integrate a almost diverging quantity over. So um, the blue curve, the inclusive two to two cross section, will exceed the total rate. So that simply means that something, when we see a singularity or something that uh, occurs like this, is probably we have a too literal interpretation of what that concept inclusive cross section really means. Just like if we see a singularity in calculation of the randomization of a charge, that typically means, or in, in the calculation of the charge distribution of something that we probably have not thought about carefully how to define charge, and uh, then we might have to do randomization. Something similar happens in this case. So the crux here lies in the definition of the parton distribution functions. These parton distribution functions that are used in order to uh, determine what is the probability of picking partons out of a proton or out, out, out of a hadron with a fixed um, flavor and a fixed, um, uh, uh, a fixed uh, energy fraction or momentum fraction. Is um, uh, is actually so these 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 objects are defined as the inclusive probability to find a parton uh, at at this energy fraction with all other interactions above this energy fraction integrated out in the derivation of the factorization of parton distributions from a partonic cross section. So the factorization the derivation relies on and very complicated integrals of all kinds of intermediate particles that you have to do in order to see that indeed all of this big blob that you kind of all of these kind of blobs here are complicated integrations factor from the less complicated integration of the simple two to two hard scattering. That means that if you uh, have detailed enough measurements just like before, um, in, in the case of looking at, at jets, if you have detailed enough measurements, these will actually probe the integrand that you've used in order to um, prove and integrate out, um, uh, to, to integrate out pieces and prove uh, the factorization of PDFs from the, uh, from the partonic cross section. So detailed enough measurements will be sensitive to these integrands. In this case, what happens is that these integrands are cut up into more than one interaction, meaning that the inclusive cross section that you should think about really is just think is just the inelastic cross section multiplied by the number of times you have to cut up these integrals, which is the average number of scatterings that you can have. In this case, the inclusive cross section can be as large as it wants. <laughs> no one tells you how large it's going to be. However, the inelastic cross section will always be smaller than the total cross section. So, thinking about in it, in it uh, about it in this way, the inclusive cross section itself can be any any number. The inelastic cross section is well defined. The only thing that you then have to worry about is you have to produce possibly more than one interaction at a time. Take a four-jet event as an example. Your detector sees a four uh, sees um, or, or, or four-particle event, I should say, as an example. The detector might see um, these four particles. They could come from a uh, single scattering with a couple of perturbative corrections, uh, say radiating a photon, and maybe a parton splitting, <coughs> excuse me, parton splitting into two partons and so on. They might not, these partons might not be well separated, then this means that they emerge from showering. They might be well separated and, and from one scattering so that they evolve, uh, that they um, emerge from a fixed order, higher order calculation. Or the jets might be well separated and emerge from two scatterings, like in this case here. So there are two partons scattering here, another two partons scattering here. Every measurement will be somewhat of a cocktail of these different phenomena. So we have to model multiple interactions in order to uh, 
provide a reasonable cocktail. The argument in order how to get, or so how do we get now to a model of multiple interactions? Well, first, let's make an assumption. Let's say the inclusive cross section that we define by sort of looking at platonic cross sections and PDFs should still be the same, uh, should still be a reasonable quantity to calculate in perturbation theory. Right, we said that the PDFs kind of have these, uh, the pattern distribution functions have these multiple interactions kind of integrated out into their definition. So the inclusive scattering, uh, two to two scattering cross section in, in, in perturbation theory does include these effects in, in, in a roundabout way. So we don't want to um, change the definition of this quantity. We still want the inclusive cross section to be valid, a valid calculation to do in, in perturbation theory. However, if we start simply overlapping, scat over overlaying scatterings and measuring the result, we will measure something that is different from the inclusive cross section. And why is that? Just like before, when we started overlap, overlaying or sort of stacking on top of each other different calc tree level calculations for multiple jets, these multiple uh, calculations themselves are not additive, just like tree level calculations are not. What we need to do is we need to have a rate for not having a second interaction to be correlated for the, with the rate of having a second interaction, much in the same way as the emission rate of the shower was correlated with the no emission rate or the pseudocal factor of the shower, or how the real emission, the singularities in real emission diagrams are correlated with the real emission, uh, with singularities in loop diagrams. We can construct a model of pattern, a multi pattern interactions, multiple interactions in ex uh, from these uh, from these from these arguments. So we say we want to preserve the overall scat the scattering probability that is given by the inclusive cross section. We add um, um, multiple interactions on top, something like this. Now an observable that previously only depended on a single final state particle will depend on a single final state particle and two additional from an, a, a subsequent interaction, uh, a secondary interaction. And then we subtract out out of the full result. I think we've just added such that if you're insensitive to these additional secondary scatterings, these two things cancel and you recover the inclusive cross section as you want. Just like we did for kind of stacking the tree level calculations on top of each other. Now we can that make that more shower-like by realizing that again, this red piece here is just the onset of these exponential pseudocal factors that we saw previously in the shower. So we can replace this by an exp uh, these exponential pseudocal factors for not having secondary interaction. So this is now a pseudocal, uh, this is now a probability not only for having no emission, but for only for not having a secondary scattering. In order again then to make sense of uh, to make uh, make sure that this whole thing preserves probability, we'd have to add the same type of exponential suppression, also to um, the rate of producing a secondary interaction, which simply says that if you produce a secondary interaction at scale t, you have not produced a secondary interaction before that scale t. So that makes this whole this whole uh, this model of multi-part interactions extremely shower like basically it's the same type of algorithm you can now decide how you want to structure this uh, this uh, um, um, or how you want to correlate this algorithm to the shower algorithm and there are various ways of doing that you could say uh, you do them independently two different types of showers that add and add on top of each other you can do them in a correlated fashion you can do one first then the other there are sort of lots of choices because this is again just a phenomenological model based on conserving the probability of the overall scattering. And I'm pretty sure that you'll hear more about uh, these types of things in in Leib's lecture. Um, suffice it to say, there are multiple ways of doing these things, and um, it's really a good way to test your wit, how to uh, how, what you want to do, and see kind of uh, what you how you approach this topic. Now. What multi-partner interactions do for you in, in, a, in, in data is that they produce some kind of underlying event. These multi-partner interactions 
fill the whole detector range of rapidity values with, with basically a flat, flat um, distribution of particles. So every sort of rapidity bin has roughly the same number of particles now when you include these double parton scattering or multiple parton scatterings. And jets might give you a more localized um, sort of uh, increase in multi particle multiplicity at or the, the, the rapidity of where this jet was. Furthermore, you can kind of distinguish between multi-pattern interactions and, um, and two, two, uh, two body scatterings producing a more complex ion state by looking at the correlations between jets. Typically, for, for let's say double pattern scattering, um, the, the jets themselves, the first and second hardest and the third and fourth hardest jets are more or less balanced. Whereas in a, a perturbative calculation, they're much less balanced. So, so depending on your observable, you can actually enhance or decrease the sensitivity to this uh, multi-pattern interactions and the underlying event that it produces. Let me skip this just to say, yeah, indeed, this is what we observe in data. And we observe in data that we do need um, multi-pattern interactions in order to describe, say, the multiplicity of hadrons. And let's just say, well, I'm postponing all the proof, all the fun, to, uh, the, uh, to one of the um, uh, subsequent lectures, because there are certain, there are definitely a lot of subtleties. One of them that I particularly find interesting is that there's no real reason to expect that the primary partons that you collide and the secondary partons from the secondary interaction that you collide are actually in the same place in the proton. Why should they be at the same longitudinal and transverse momentum in the, in, in the extended object that is the proton? There's no re real reason to expect that. So in, in, indeed, you would have to add a type of model of the, um, of the space-time structure of the proton in order to do a reasonably good job at describing data that is sensitive to underlying event. And we'll certainly hear more about this in, in, the, in, the, in, in the dedicated lecture. There is a question, so go ahead, Luis. Oh, could you very quickly just clarify what you said about the jets being balanced or unbalanced? I missed a bit of that. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, let me quickly go back to this slide here, and I think it's easier to see. Now, right, you did, uh, if you um, produce, um, um, if you are, in a sense, in the center of mass, uh, if you're uh, center of momentum frame of the collision is the same as the center of momentum frame of your uh, of your partons that collide. Then you st start colliding partons head on, and their form momenta have to uh, and the and the form momenta of the scattering um, uh, products have to have to balance each other. If there are if you have two scatterings of that same type, you have two particles coming in producing two, two, two outgoing particles, another set of particles coming in, producing, let's say, again, two particles that have balanced um, four, four momenta or three momenta. In the case of a single scattering that produces um, the same event, you now have four particles that you only, only the, the sum of each of the three momenta of all four particles has to add up to the form, uh, to the three momentum of the beams that you collide. So individually, if you look at say, um, the, um, uh, the momentum of, of this particle and this particle, their sum doesn't have to balance. If you, if you, if you, if you know what I mean. Yes, so that makes sense. Thank okay. you. Okay, good, good. There are so two more people who have raised their hands. Now I don't see your names anymore, but. Um, Go ahead. I suppose that's me, sorry. <laughs> um, I was just, so I just like to clear something up in my head, I suppose, mm -hmm. which, is, which has to do with uh, what you were saying about the underlying event and uh, an MPI. Um, I thought that why you get this um, uniform PT everywhere is not because of extra interactions from the proton, but rather because there's bits 
well, there's remainders from the proton which go in any which direction, while the, and so multi-parton inter interactions would themselves produce, say, new jets. So I was, I was wondering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think that's, so, so, so that's, that's, yeah, so, so there are remnants of a proton that are still left over, even if, even if you do multi-parton interaction. And these remnants will sit at very kind of uh, far, uh, very high and very low multi uh, very low rapidity. So somewhere out, out here. What happens in between is indeed that you produce a lot of additional scatterings that all produce relatively um, soft, low energy jets. And adding all of those up and having no clear preference where they should sit in rapidity will give you this pedestal. So it's the sum of all possible ways of creating, or, or sort of the sum of all of the under, all of the multi -interac multiple interactions. There might be thirty of those that give a roughly flat pedestal. Okay, thanks. But it is relatively rare, say, to so to get, let's say, two jets in an event where one would stem from the primary scattering and the other one from a say secondary one. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. That's true. It it. it it's a fluctu it's a it's a rare fluctuation. Um, it, it can and can can certainly happen. In particular, if you look at um, specific the observables that are designed to kind of isolate those out. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And then there was one more question I had. I think. No, I think this was just still that okay. noises and was still up. Ah, I see. Okay. Then, okay. Then let me move on just to say. Well, this is an excellent field to apply your wit because there, uh, what you there is no very strong underlying theory yet of these multiple interactions. So uh, all the things that you have to, uh, all the things that you can do, uh, rely on your intuition. So excellent way to sort of uh, use your intu intuition. Well, let's move on and start uh, lecture four. And I will not actually go through all of this, all of these slides today. Also, given that uh, uh, I have heard that Leif's lecture will cover quite a bit of that as well. So there will be some duplication already in the things that I'm saying. And I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on all the details because you have a dedicated lecture. Again, again going back to the big picture, we now have arrived at a state where we have uh, combined a hard scattering in red here with part and shower evolution and secondary scatterings that also could then part and shower. But we're still at the level of having partons. Partons are, of course, not observable objects. They're colored and color charge has to be confined. So we need to find a way of converting these partons into hadrons. And then if we produce excited hadrons, we need to um, also have a way of decaying these. So in this, uh, in, in this game, typically we only have phenomenological models and data, uh, data parameterizations and kind of trying to imprint previous data on an event generator becomes very important in order to make these models as um, predictive and flexible as possible. I should also say that the conversion of partons to hadrons, and particularly the decay of hadrons to stable particles, actually produce the vast majority of the events uh, of the particles that you would see in the detector. Uh, and uh, the particular the decay of resonances can dwarf the multiplicity of partons by orders of magnitude. So these are important pieces to get right. So why are there phenomenological models? Well. The answer is quite simple. Um, if you've solved, if you've, if, if no one has yet solved um, strong coupling quantum field theory. The question that we need to ask ourselves if we want to, um, uh, if you want to derive a model of strong coupling field theory is how do the partons that we now have produced, how do they co coalesce into hadrons? And naively, there could be three ways of thinking about that. You could say, well, the individual partons coalesce into hadrons. That's what Feynman and uh, his student Rick Field um, thought in, uh, uh, proposed with a bit of caveats in the 70s. But 
Nowadays, this is hardly used because there is no flavor and momentum conservation in this model. It's not ideal. You could go the other extreme and say that all partons collectively um, coalesce into all hadrons. Could work. However, it's a bit in conflict with perturbative QCD, which tells you that there are there is some factorization of the perturbative cross section. And you probably want to sort of factor that in. Also, it would be difficult to imagine a jetty behavior if all partons can drag on all other partons in order to produce hadrons. So the middle ground between those is that you have subsets of partons that produce a subset of hadrons. And that's, based, that's the basis, that's the thought behind the most successful models of hadronization in high energy physics. Two of them uh, in particular are, uh, I'll discuss in a second, which are the string and the cluster model, uh, which lie at the core of uh, both um, of event generators, um, Pythia and Horik and Sherpa. The realization in order to set up these models that you need in order to decide how, which subset of particles um, uh, 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 hadronize into which hadrons is that partons, in a sense, close to each other, hadronize coherently. And there are two main schools of what close means. Close could be something that is related to perturbation theory, meaning that, for example, partons that are close in color, meaning that are color connected to each other for, for, through gluons, hadronize close, to get, uh, close to each other because they're also close in phase space. Cl partons that are close in color space happen to be close in phase space in the approximation in which we derive our splitting functions. So that's maybe a good starting point. You start by saying, you look at, you follow the color and things that are color connected hadronize collectively. So in the case of this um, five parton state here, you would have four clusters. You could take another, uh, another viewpoint and say that um, partons that are close in color alone will not hadronize together, but partons that form, um, um, that form a string, a kind of a color flux tube indeed um, hadronize together. That's more invoking non-perturbative insights or insights into superconductors. That is the basis of the string hadronization model. And I should note already here that real life models really are a mixture of both. Uh, they might not say it, but clearly you know, there are sort of benefits to both of these viewpoints and um, ditching one, point for, uh, one viewpoint for, for the other is well, in any case, always a, bad, always a bad idea. So before going, um, into the details of these models. I'll probably skip some of those. Let's think about what the notion of closeness means in a dense system, in a busy system like the LHC. In a busy system, it can happen that you have color singlet clusters of particles that actually, if you look at the detector, almost overlap with each other. So for example, you could have two Z bosons that uh, happened that that happened to recoil against the system of very heavy, uh, very uh, very high energy jets, get boosted in the same direction, and their decay products more or less overlap with each other. If you think of these decay of these decay products hadronizing only by thinking about their color connection, that would mean that the decay products of the first set decay hadronize. Um, kind of collectively, the decay products of the second set hadronize collectively, although in the detector, the quarks uh, and the antiquark from the two decays are actually closer to each other than um, the, uh, the quark and the antiquark of a single decay. So it might be beneficial in terms of minimizing uh, the disturbance of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, of the direction of the particles, and in order to maybe minimize something like a free energy to actually say, well, no, it's these particles from different decays that hadronize together. This, system, this um, idea is called color reconnection. In a sense, you take a busy system and instead of blindly saying, well, these are color neutral objects or kind of strings, 
stay well hydrogenized together, you look at trying to minimize something like an energy, a free energy, before deciding which particle patterns will collectively uh, coalesce into hadrons. In a sense, trying to aim to neutralize flavor and color more locally, which seems like a good idea, given that if you neutralize things more sort of globally, you might destroy some of the correlations within a individual jet by dragging particles out of jets. However, I know there are, this is basically now, we're in the realm of modeling and hand waving. There are two types of, of, th of thinking about these color reconnections. There's a perturbative picture and there's a non-perturbative picture. The perturbative picture assumes that you have ultra so soft gluons that are so soft that they basically don't change the momentum of the particles that they interact with, with but that slightly rotate the colors or reconnect the colors in order to um, minimize some kind of um, energy measure. And you can do that in various ways. And uh, the outcome of that is that um, your inputs to hadronization, your, uh, your particles that coalesce together into hadrons can become very, very different. Meaning they can switch from particles that would likely be producing mesons to particles that more likely will produce baryons. Or you can, uh, or sort of particles that produce very small, uh, very low, mass systems that will then basically almost immediately decay into um, stable hadrons. You can, um, you can bend into systems that produce very high energy um, clusters that only that will decay into very high excite, highly excited states, which then only decay into stable things. There are, there's a lot of freedom here. We know that color reconnection is in fact needed in order to describe data. And this is, for example, shown here in the average PT per, uh, of, uh, of particles as, an, as, a number, as, uh, as a function of the number of charged particles. We clearly see that without color reconnection, we have no hope of describing this data. However, you introduce a lot of unknowns and degrees of freedom by accepting that this is something that will occur. Another, uh, another approach to color connection is looking at non-perturbative dynamics. This is to say, well, you indeed construct strings first by following the rules that I'm going to go through in, in a second. And then these non-perturbative objects themselves, if they are densely enough packed, will actually interact with each other by fusing into each other, which will form ropes by repelling each other, which is also called shoving sometimes, or by swapping string and, and with each other in order to minimize the length or the, or the uh, tension of a string. And then you implement very, uh, all these individual non-perturbative effects uh, separately and uh, check what, and get a feeling of how much they influence um, what you see in data. In total, I think what I wanna left, leave you with, with here is that both of these pictures are probably valid and reality is really a mixture of both. So it's not quite as straightforward as, as you would like to set up or to sort of decide what are the particles that um, collectively coalesce into the subset of, uh, into subsets of hadrons. But let's assume that we've figured this out. Let me see what the time is. Ah, okay. Let's assume that we figured it out. And assume and, and have uh, go under the unspoken assumption that these models do actually not change the total cross section. They just rearrange particles. Again, kind of we say these models do not influence. Uh, so the, the reconnection of or the rearrangement of the final state of the interaction does not change the cross section to produce this uh, to produce a final state from a uh, simple initial state. The same type of um, assumption is also true when partons coalesce to hadrons. And more generally, we assume that partons coalesce to hadrons with unit probability. The rate of 
or, or the color, color neutralization has to happen with probability one in order to uh, for the calculation to make sense if things have if color uh, if color neutralization happens with less probability then we've done something bad in the calculation of our initial sort of um, prior distribution from which we produced say gluons and so on okay under this assumption let's now look at the two main models that uh, produce that we use in order to convert hadrons to uh, to partons to hadrons those go under the name of string and cluster hadronization. String hadronization is typically something that people associate with uh, Lund and the Lund school of, of thinking about non predictive physics and is also implement is then the basis and kind of the even the progenitor of, of the Pithier event generator. Whereas the cluster model was initially uh, developed um, with uh, a generator like Hurwitz in mind and is also used in Sherpa. Going first to the string, we've seen a lot of perturbative reasoning. Now let's look at a couple of non-perturbative ideas. So non-perturbative QCD is hard. However, we do know some results of non-perturbative QCD from say the lattice uh, QCD. One thing that we do know is that the, the potential between two quarks is linear, uh, is linear with, uh, 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 is linearly related to the distance between the quarks. So that means that the force field per unit length is constant. This is the same as if uh, as the force field between the two endpoints of a string that you stretch, like an actual like rubber string, piece of rubber string. This is so the basis of the string model is indeed just to say, well, um, we try to collect particles into each other such that the thing that we look at afterwards looks like a rubber string and we treat this rubber string as if this is a collective potential from which we produce hadrons. Now there is of course a non-linearity in the potential between two quarks and uh, that comes um, from very high energy the quarks that interact with each other through very high energy gluons for example in perturbation theory. Another aspect that is not linear in the potential is that if you look in detail, um, there is only a small uh, region where the potential between two quarks is linear. And full QCD uh, will tell you that at some point, um, the potential between two quarks flattens off. But you cannot um, arbitrarily uh, increase the separation between two quarks and get an arbitrarily higher uh, potential energy. At some point, it's more energetically favorable if this rubber band between the quarks actually breaks so that you have smaller string segments that now have a smaller tension and thus a smaller energy stored in them. If this is the case, then if you have very small string segments uh, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that don't further break, these you can think of as mesons. So the strings, we have very small string segments, very small different, uh, very small potential energy stored in the, in the ends. So the string uh, ends will just oscillate into each other in something called yo-yo mode indefinitely producing a stable state that we call a meson. Before getting there, a very high energy string have to break a couple of times and they do so by creating pairs of particles inside of a strong force field by uh, vacuum tunneling that then kind of uh, detach um, the original endpoints from each other. Like so, so you create a path, a pair through tunneling, detaching the um, sort of interaction between the endpoints, making uh, energetically more favorable smaller strings. You do that until the strings are small enough so that you actually have produced mesons. That is the core of the string model. And this idea is extremely old, um, starting back from, from basically the 30s, so almost 
uh, 100 years and was first um, looked at by Heisenberg and, and Schringer. And so the Schringer calculation is a bit later in the context of a strong electromagnetic force field creating fermion pairs. Um, this is, uh, we, we take this as an indication that the tunneling mechanism that we think of is indeed reasonable because well, Heisenberg told us. Um, so what the QCD string does, it breaks the creation of uh, quark antiquark pairs according to a uh, tunneling probability given by this exponential distribution where kappa is the tension of the string and mt is the transverse mass. So the sum of the mass squared and the mo transverse momentum squared. That means that um, uh, the creation of uh, quark antiquark pairs with a high P transverse momentum or with a high mass is suppressed. Typically meaning that charm quark production, tunneling charm quarks out of, the pro uh, out of the vacuum is already very, very unlikely. And it also means that um, producing something with a high PT is very unlikely, meaning that if a string breaks, it typically breaks at very low transverse momentum, meaning that the particles that you produce have relatively low transverse momentum relative to the original axis, meaning that they're all correlated, uh, all um, um, in, in basically in the same direction as the original string, meaning you produce back-to-back -back particle productions and string center of mass strain from that. So the string breaking, how it works with this tunneling, actually makes sure that you produce jetty structures. Um, let me see what the time says. Okay. Um, moving on. Now, unfortunately, QCD is not only quarks. <laughs> so, so far we've said, well, strings are stretched between quarks and these strings can break by producing more quarks out of a vacuum. However, you also have gluons. There are various ways of thinking about gluons as kind of additional pieces of the string. You could think of the gluon as not changing the string at all something that doesn't change the color field, that seems extremely unlikely, because otherwise why would we have quantum chromodynamics? And indeed, that's not how we think of it. You could think of the gluon producing a new type of string segment that is attached to the previous string segments by some kind of new coupling. That is technically possible. However, it's not something that is uh, very sound in a relativistic theory to kind of decide, okay, you've attached something at a fixed point. That's not a particularly good relativistic um, uh, um, uh, statement. Also, you add a lot, you can add new, pra you add new parameters to this, uh, to, to the model that you might not need. So the approach of the string model is indeed just to say, well, the gluon is just a kink on the string. It's a string and you pluck it at an initial state. So the gluon is just the plucking of the string and the string starts oscillating a bit. These kinks are already pres are present indeed in massless relativistic strings. You can write down the uh, equation of state for massless relativistic strings and find that the, this is a viable solution. And the good thing of this is that there are no additional parameters that you need because there's no additional coupling between the gluon string and the quark string anymore. So that's nice and very predictive. I should say that in reality, by now, um, models that we use for the LHC actually have a mixture of these two, depending on what is your initial um, uh, starting point, what are the initial particles that form a string. So if you have more um, color reconnection for forming inputs to that would hadronize into baryons, you might have more of these types of junctions. So again, you see that um, this simple model is not quite um, right yet for data. Anyway, let's say the gluon is a kink on the string. Again, just like plucking the string of a guitar. So that means you um, sort of excite one of these string ends at the very early beginning, you pluck it, and then this um, uh, kink travels along the string and so on and so on. Now, since this kink the string, uh, in, on the string is connected to both ends of the string, to two string segments, it loses energy twice as fast as, as the individual endpoints. And that's actually in accordance with QCD, 
because the color factor, sort of the thing that kind of that tells you how large, what is the strength of the of the gluon coupling versus what's the strength of the quark coupling in QCD, if you have an infinite number of colors, actually goes to two in favor of the gluon. So this is uh, kind of beneficial. Even it, it does make sense in terms of uh, in terms of QCD. What is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that um, gluons themselves um, pluck the string, meaning that there is again now another direction on the string into which on, on along which you can produce um, hadrons in the in the center of mass frame of this particular string segment. This is called the string effect. Hadrons will be produced along the direction of the original strings, which means that there is there will be a gluon, a jet forming from the gluon. There will be a jet forming from the antiquark, for example, and a jet forming from a quark. But there will almost be no hadrons formed opposite of this large gluon jet. The string model tells you there will be no hadrons there, and you can actually go and look. So this is some kind of coherence effect that that um, sort of correlates all the hadrons to lie in this in in this um, in this gluon jet and not. Um, opposite side of it due to the gluon kink. A similar type of, uh, of coherence effect is already found in perturbative QCD. In perturbative QCD tells you, so now we're moving on to the next model, the cluster model. Perturbative QCD tells you that gluon production at comparable angles is actually suppressed by destructive interference. You can write down the amplitudes and see that, or amplitude squares and see that that's the case. That means, and this is the basis of the, of the cluster model, that color single particle pairs, color singlet particle pairs, actually end up close to phase space because if they, everything that does is not close to is not close in phase space, meaning well separated, comparable angles, um, is uh, killed by destructive interference. This phenomenon is called preconfinement, and preconfinement, in a sense, mimics the string effect at a perturbative level. Suggesting that you can have another model of how to sort of decide which particles coalesce into hadrons together, the cluster model. So you use a perturbative calculation that enforces this type of coherence. Then you convert gluons to QQ bar pairs in some manual form, and then collect the QQ bar pairs into color singlet clusters, which then decay isotropically into two hadrons. Now, if the cluster is too heavy to decay into two hadrons, you need to do something to this cluster first before decaying it into hadrons. But looking at the cluster and the mass spectrum of these clusters that you get from simulation, you indeed see that this is very, very small. It's very much peaked around um, a GeV or so of mass. So this means that independent of where you started out from, the cluster model gives masses of these clusters that are relatively close to hadronic scales and will likely decay into hadrons. And you do that with a flat phase space distribution. And phase space alone will tell you that heavy, the production of heavy hadrons is then suppressed because of the phase space, because of lower, less phase space available to produce mass. And however, there is a long tail towards higher masses. So what you do in these higher mass clusters is indeed these clusters first undergo fission. So these, uh, these clusters, heavy clusters, decay into lighter clusters, and these lighter clusters then decay into hadrons eventually. This is extremely similar to string breaking. And you should note that uh, you should note that 50% roughly of hadrons that emerge from these, uh, of, of final hadrons that you see in the detector actually emerge from these split clusters. So you already see that um, there is some overlap between these models because you have to sort of implement similar ideas in order to make sense of, um, sort of say, for example, tails of distributions. Now would be a good time to um, compare these, but I won't. Um, I'll leave that pleasure to, to Leif. And finish off almost with one final thing that I haven't touched upon, which is the thing that really produces the uh, vast majority of particles in the detector. And that's the decay of excited hadrons. So here's a decay, for example, of a B star meson. And you already see that there is 
that are uh, various so the B star meson refers to decay into a B by radiating off its excitedness into a photon. This B0 can decay, it can oscillate into a B0 baryon, which then decays into a D star meson. So now that includes uh, charms and uh, uh, a neutrino and an electron. The D star will then decay into a D0 and a pi plus. The D0 decays into a rho and a k on, and the rho decays into pi's, which eventually, for example, decay into plus and minus pairs. There are pi zeros which decay into plus and minus pairs. So you start off with one particle, you end up with, I didn't even count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You end up with nine. So we could definitely, for these types of things, if you produce B mesons, you might uh, increase the multiplicity by a factor of 10 if you have too many of those. And B mesons you produce if you have high energy scatterings. The more high energy things you have, the high energy hard, hard scattering you have, the more likely it is to produce highly excited hadrons that will have to decay into stable particles. Some of these decays will be, um, uh, will then leave displaced vertices in the detector. For example, the B decays certainly would, which then may be important for you in order to tag um, these, uh, the jets that come from these B decays or that contain these B decays as B jets that you, for example, might need in order to reconstruct a top core. So it's important to get these decays right. The majority of particles will be produced and you need, and you need really kind of a lot of detail. However, it's dirty business in the sense that uh, a lot of the decays themselves are very difficult to calculate. So if there are calculations and if you have hadronic matrix elements in order to determine what these decays are, you try to implement them into the, in the, into the generator as much as possible. And that holds specifically for B decays, but also for, for the decays of the tau, uh, for the tau lepton. Since the tau lepton itself, again, leaves displaced vertices and its decays um, can be uh, really sort of amazingly well, attract, attract amazingly well, you need a good model in order to handle those. Then, because a lot of these decays contain charged particles, you try, will try to include as many QED effects as possible. Once you have done that, you typically end up with only a very, very, very small fraction of decays properly handled in the event generator. So for the rest of the decays, you try to invoke the decay tables that have been measured in the last, I don't know, 100 years by looking at the particle data group book and coding all the decay tables. However, <laughs> that's typically still not enough because quite often these decay tables are incomplete, in particular when it comes to uh, resonances and proper full multiplets of resonance of, of hadronic resonances. Because I know quite often we don't have all the hadronic resonances measured yet. So these decay tables are incomplete and need constant updating. If they're in incomplete, you will start being creative. Um, uh, creative in kind of deciding, okay, this, there is a new resonance here. I'll call that new resonance uh, um, zeta one, two, three. And I will decide what is what are the decay uh, channels of this resonance. And then you hope that uh, no one ever notices in an experiment. If they do, well, then you tell them, well, you should probably measure this. If they don't, then um, you've at least made a, a reasonable effort at a complete model. So let me maybe stop with this, uh, with a statement. If there's something incomplete, you need to be creative. That really is the gist of doing Monte Carlo. If you find that there is something in your theory that you will understand, you'll try to implement these statements into your Monte Carlo event generator in as much detail as you possibly can and with, with the limited time that you have. If something is incomplete, you start invoking your intuition as much as possible. That, for, that goes, for example, for multi-pattern interactions, for hadronization, and so on. So you really sort of work at deriving models of the physical world based on your intuition, just like you should do physics. And with that, 
I hope I've tried, I can, can convince you a bit that event generators themselves are not magic. They're not black boxes. There's a lot of physics in them that is useful to understand in order to understand how do different aspects of the event generation influence my understanding of my measurement. So Monte Carlo event generators use inversion and rejection sampling profusely in order to produce events. These events look like they should look as much as real data as possible, kind of these are pseudo data events. Monte uh, event generators will use sophisticated perturbative calculations, parton showers, and multiple interactions to arrive at um, a uh, relatively complete perturbative model that would then be um, translated to a non perturbative model and hadrons through um, different types of phenomenological models that try to embed as much of previous knowledge as possible. So all of this is good. And you say, well, that's uh, awesome. Why, do that, why would I ever do something else? Well, this level of detail does indeed come with uh, a large set of parameters that you would have to evaluate and that you have to be careful about and maybe even tune to previous data in order to make sense of upcoming data. And with that, I'm surprisingly, even um, a, a couple of minutes early, I did not expect that. So I took a lot of stuff from, from Leif that I didn't want to, but he'll have to handle that. So uh, now we still have some time for questions. Go ahead. Is, there is actually even already one question in the chat, but let me first thank you, Stefan, for this excellent introduction to event generators. And I think thank this you. sets a really nice basis for for this school and for the more detailed lectures on us on event and other aspects that are to come and in particular also for the tutorials where you all students mm -hmm. uh, all of you can can try out these event generators in certain aspects of, of what stefan told you about so thank you very much stefan for making this big very effort of the four-hour lecture then let's start with one question that is already in the chat uh, whether you could explain the meaning of displaced vertices yeah yeah happily so um a displaced vertex is a set of, D of, 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 of tracks that you find in your detector that do not point to um, the collision center. So let's say you collide particles and you, let's say you have 100 tracks and uh, 90, 90 of those tracks all point to a common origin. But 10 of these tracks po point at something that is a bit further away in the detector. Maybe that happened in 90, 90 of these tracks point towards kind of the interaction region in the vacuum, but maybe 10 of those point to a place that is in your calorimeter or something. That would, that's what you would then call a displaced vertex. So if something that, if, if you have a particle that has a long lifetime, it might sort of propagate out of the big collision region into the detector and only decay there, leaving something that looks displaced from the rest of the collision. Or even within the, still um, not even hitting the detector yet, but still being displaced within the beam pipe, I suppose. Yeah, which I find, uh, this I find particularly amazing that experimenters can actually do that. That you have displaced vertices that are still kind of very close to the collision region. I, th I find that, that's amazing. I suppose it might be even easier because then you have the tracks to follow back towards the. Fair enough. Well, I don't know. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. But, there, but one See, question might be where do these to these a th a theorist. <laughs> but but where, where do these displaced vertices come from in the event generator from the event generator side? What, what mechanisms? So so, so a typical thing is that if you have long lifetimes, if you have, um, for example, excited, or if you have hadrons that have a long lifetime, like the B or the D then uh, these can travel a uh, microscopic dis distance uh, before uh, they decay. And that uh, kind of traveling long enough and with uh, reasonably enough, uh, with reasonable Lorentz construction, they can travel a, even a millimeter, a couple millimeters, so that you can definitely, and, and differences between sort of several millimeters you can measure in the detector. So that's an important distinction from what one might also think about when you have multiple vertices, but tracks point back towards from pile up, for example, where you would have different proton-proton interactions, which mm -hmm. is at different 
origins, right? This is yeah. from the same proton proton direction. You can still have a displaced vertex mm. due to those um, traveling mm. hadrons. And then okay. you, you can uh, even go uh, sort of more sort of more exotic, and uh, some of the vertices, these decay vertices might be uh, very very far inside of the detector, and then it might be very difficult to uh, to trigger on these types of events. So long lived particles are again one of these nasty examples where things happen very at the outer shells of the detector um, because uh, the decays happen so late. That's the extreme case of a displaced vertex. Yes. All right, there are a couple more questions in the chat, but someone had unmuted just a minute ago and I basically talked into their being unmuted. So I just wanted to give the chance. Um, if you were unmuting and want to ask a question, then please try again. Anything? Okay, it was not me who unmute, but maybe I can take the chance to ask. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, the pileup is simulated at any point uh, at any point in the event generator. Um, typically, um, uh, typically no. What typically is done for pileup is that you um, run kind of you overlay different. Um, you overlay multiple outcomes of uh, of event generators. So you run the event generator for for for, for um, a process that is reasonably inclusive. That gives you a certain sort of um, sort of set of say say hundred thousand events, and then you squash these hundred thousand events into um, a thousand that you over uh, where you kind of you overlay. Um, um, interactions with each other, and then and you have to be very, I guess, sophisticated in doing this in order to uh, uh, how you overlay these things in order to kind of model um, the uh, the pileup. But typically, pileup is 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 um, not included in the generators, but you use uh, generators in order to create the inputs in order to uh, to um, uh, to model pileup. Okay, thanks. Okay, then the next question in the chat was whether you could talk briefly about pattern distribution functions and how they affect multi-pattern multi interactions. Uh, briefly, probably not, but I can talk about it. <laughs> um, so um, it's, um, it's quite subtle in, in the sense that in order to derive the factorization of the cross-section into a long distance part that you capture in the pattern distributions and a short distance part that you capture in the platonic cross section, you need to prove a lot of things that uh, you need to prove that a lot of different effects do not affect this factorization. And if you look at inclusive and at simple enough observables will actually sort of can actually be um, combined into a simple prefactor, for example. And one of these uh, simple things, one of these cases is the case, uh, one of these things that you have to prove factors off from the rest are uh, exchanges of very soft uh, gluons between the protons that collide. You, if you derive the factorization of uh, for into part and distribution functions and partonic cross section, you have to sort of prove that ultra soft gluons do not mess up this factorization. And you do that by kind of looking at various diagrams and various integrands, and then using a lot of arguments on, on causality and unitarity to indeed say um, this overall factor, this part of these, these soft gluons themselves, will factor into a common prefactor that you can effectively normalize to one, such that you don't have to actually do anything, you don't have to calculate it in this particular case of factorization. If you, however, look at an observable that doesn't fulfill the requirements with which you derive that you can factorize off these soft gluons, then you might actually start seeing these kind of types of multi pattern interaction effects. And um, then you're basically, you're, you're, your proof of this factorization breaks down <laughs> and you do have to do something about um, how to handle these, these additional interactions that otherwise would have Sort of you could have integrated to a unit prefactor. 
It's um, something that would be an excellent question to ask Dave, because Dave actually proved these types of uh, theorems for us in the early 80s. And those are beautiful papers to read. A bit technical, but beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you, you can keep those for the QCD lectures yeah. for these types of questions. That's good. Um, I, there, there are two more in the chat, and I would actually follow up with the last of those and then go to the second last one. Yeah. Because that's a follow up question on a pile up. In yeah. experimental simulations, one generally uses something called min bias events, yeah. as pile, minimum bias events as pile up. Could you explain what minimum bias liter literally means here? <laughs> so minimum bias means that you try to do, um, that you um, try to have as little assumptions as possible on the generation of uh, the events. Meaning that you do not assume that in these events, you would actually produce a high energy scattering. You would say you might produce one, but you don't have to, you don't enforce this criterion. If you have, uh, uh, so you you will have in order to produce min bias events, um, you will have to include all kinds of other kind of non perturbed channels of particle production in order to make sure that you're not biased towards only high energy particle production. So you use things that kind of try to capture um, very sort of few hadron production in very forward regions by something called diffraction, these kind of things in order to produce a as unbiased sample as possible. This is what it literally, literally means. Very good. And then moving away from, from the underlying event um, to something different, how do event generators handle mixing between states during propagation? <laughs> so, um, in, within until you have um, excited, uh, until you have the, the outcomes of, of, of hadronization and kind of excited hadrons that then would decay, you don't. You assume that the mixing is, uh, you, either there is no mixing at that level, or if there is mixing, that it would partially be covered by um, uh, your uh, prior distribution that you've calculated in in, in perturbation theory. So certainly you would at that state not include any kind of mixing between excited hadron states. Now, when it comes to um, the mixing within the decay, um, uh, within kind of the decays of excited hadrons, I, the, 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 the quick answer is you try to um, code the hadronic matrix amounts that would, for example, give you uh, a decay like the one here. We actually have a B star that decays, a, 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 a B zero that decays into a D star, a neutrino and electron through, um, um, the, the, um, through the mixing. But you wouldn't actually sort of, in this particular case, um, have a B, a, a B zero bar in, an intermediate state in the event generator. You'd actually do all of this thing at once. At least Prithia would, for example, do that. And, but I don't know a lot, to be honest, about these things. So um, if anyone else has, has a better answer or sort of a more detailed answer, I'd also be quite curious to hear. I think maybe to add one more comment on this, so at least on the Sherpa side. Uh, you can also have these explicit mixings in the event record, but what is also important to, to include in the generation if you want to do kind of B physics with mixing is whether the CP violation effects are implemented within the mixing itself or mm -hmm. in, in the decay itself or in some kind of an interference between those two. Mm -hmm. So these are effects which are implemented in, in some event generators uh, more in, in more detail uh, mm -hmm. than in others. And, and there are certain specialized event generators like EVT gen for, mm. for B decays or hadron decays in general, yeah. which also implement these types of effects yeah. in, in more detail. There's a hand raised from Naomi. Uh, hello. I was just wondering um, how do you get the proportions in the end of how many B star zero mesons you produce versus like D star or something like that? And um, is that tuned from date or is that something else? Um, so 
So that's, in a sense, a, um, a, an outcome of the model. That the model, kind of in a sense, the way how you do the hadronization will give you a certain distribution of, 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 of B stars. It does so, of course, <laughs> by having a certain set of parameters that would influence the rate of the B stars. And those would, you'd in fact tune to the data. Uh, in, in Pythia, there's the famous, there are those famous Bowler parameters that determine what is the uh, what is the fragmentation function for 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 B quarks to B mesons, and you can tweak that a bit in order to change your rate and uh, the distribution of uh, uh, the, the momentum distribution of the initial of the B mesons. So yeah, in the end, um, it's an outcome of the model, but very much guided by uh, tuning to previous data. Okay, thank you. So tuning is, in, in a sense, I, I haven't touched on, unfortunately, but is, is also a very crucial and important piece of the event generation. So uh, that you have now written this, you have this elaborate, very detailed uh, generator. And in order to make this kind of the best possible model, you actually try to, with tuning, kind of in, in, in a sense, imprint previous data onto the parameters of this model as much as possible so that it contains as much global knowledge as possible. It's a kind of global a fit to the global data set in a sense, this tuning. There's another question in the chat also going into, into this direction, namely the question the, about heteronization. Uh, how are baryons produced in string models? It <laughs> seems like you could only produce mesons if you only yeah. split strings. Uh, I, I leave that to, to Leif to explain, but there are, some, there, 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 there are two ways. Um, quickly. One of them is these, these junctions that I mentioned before, kind of that could, that can actually produce um, uh, baryons if these junctions are between um, uh, quark-like string segments. And the other way of doing it is that instead of tunneling um, uh, quark and anti-quark pairs out of, the, out of the strong force field between quarks, you actually tunnel um, a quark-quark pair or quark-anti-quark-anti-quark uh, anti -quark pair. So diquarks out of the vacuum. That's called the popcorn model. And I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Leif will, will mention exactly these things in his lecture. Very good. I see you have lots of questions. Uh, the Excellent. lecture has given you lots of intriguing knowledge already. And uh, some of this will be followed up by detailed lectures in, in the next days. So unless there are any urgent last questions i don't see any in the chat and i don't see any hands raised at the moment uh, if you want to then do so now there's a thank you for the lectures in the chat so i appreciate it thank you and i don't see any further questions so thanks again stefan and everyone for connecting and we will see you again in the afternoon to the um at the usual time of 2 p.m European, Central European time uh, for the QCD introduction number three and four. Perfect. Sounds good. See Thanks. You and Bye. we see Stefan again in the evening, probably for the recitation yeah, session. Right? That's right. Cool. That's right. Then, thank see you. you. Then. Talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B